Episode 1, Everleaf Pines, The Court of Elder Bows. I soared on the wind at great speed, a message wrought with death weighing on my mind. Sensing where we were going, my drake began to descend and we flew over southern Enchandrus Forest after departing the Noldum Plain. The woods below me were green and vibrant. Somewhere to the north, under the sea of trees, were the hidden moon furrow gardens, tended by the sylvan yelkai, horned stag, and deer elk fairies. They were the guardians of the magically enriched soil that produces the enchanted tomatoes, apples, squash, cucumbers, cabbage, radishes, and turnips of extraordinary sizes, unbelievable taste, and healing virtues. Enchandrous forest was home to the willow weirds, a race of man-sized tree people that could stand still and mimic small trees. Other denizens of the wood were the populous polywogs, a heavily armored insect people of the beetle variety with bug eyes that literally lit up when they were excited. The polywogs could roll up into a tight ball of sharp bladed exoplate armor, virtually impenetrable. Though the fierce of countenance, the polywogs were friendly and peaceful when not in war. They stood about three and a half foot tall, though some were slightly taller. In the five mile plain between Enchandrus and Everleaf Pines were rolling hills like the swells of a great sea. The blowing of the grasses added to this effect. I flew over several groups of moving figures and animals. From my vantage point in the sky, I could see that all of, all of these groups were heading toward TL City and Everleaf. They were going to Elder Bows. In the thousands, the Fae were moving toward the ancient court. The groups were of doe-eyed yelkai bearing weapons and armor with baggage laying over their backs, crowds of willow weirds like small patches of walking woods moving eastward, long columns of organized polywogs holding long spears snaked across the plains. Each polywog stepped directly in the footprint of the polywog before him. Large brown furred wolverines crawled in packs with small halflings that looked up as I passed overhead. I then passed over a lone figure walking by herself, a tall nymph with pale skin and golden locks having the beauty of a goddess. All around her flitted about tire briar pixies in a cloud of activity. There were many others all moving toward Everleaf, some I had never seen. I knew that Arbor Realm and the many smaller woods home to fairies were probably emptying this way. It was known that fairies lived in Norwood Reach and in Faynot on the Water. Nothing good lived in Highwood. Bad news travels fast among the Fae. In my descent, I approached Everleaf and began skirting over the treetops. Passing over the forest, there were no elves that emerged to escort me in. This meant nothing. I knew the Elvani were vigil vigilantly watching from their tree trunk watch posts concealed throughout their territory. No doubt the eyes of wood elves were already following me. Though ever wary of men, we Carrions had good relations with the Elvani, though the fairies did not participate in these bonds. The Elvani claimed that our pale green eyes looked just like their own and that this was the source of our good relations. I do not know. Aside from us, the only other human the Elvani acknowledged with respect was Decker. For some reason, unknown to me, the strange man was considered a friend to the elves. A movement caught my eyes. Below me, I saw through the branches and leaves two darting shadows in the canopy of greenery, my drake tensed, having also seen them. Nighting wards. Rarely seen away from Everleaf Pines, the giant spotted werewards were vicious fairy owls. I watched as one shadow just below the treetops whisked ahead, disappearing in the greenery. 
it would inform the hedge guard of my approach. The other remained below me, worrying my steed. I flew over a gooseberry glade, one of the many sunlit gardens of the fairies. A group of hobwalkies looked up at me, and at seeing the quick pass of the nighting ward shadowing me, they broke into a run in the direction we flew. Fairies began emerging from their spruce wood burrows to follow us. Underneath my drake, the passing trees were ancient. In the forest of Everleaf was the largest concentration of fairies in all of Dagathar. Smaller colonies did exist. In northern Everleaf, a separatist group of fae lived undisturbed in the ruins of Sothril's ring. Others lived apart in Norwood Reach and in Ladywood and others yet in Treehelm. Long ago, the kinship of the fae had been broken. Everleaf Pines is the center of the fairy world, of all sylvan and woodland beings known as the home of elder bows, the golden limb, also called the ancient cedar of Aden. His court is a wide one, 1,260 foot clearing of which he occupies the center as a colossus, a monolithic tree 414 feet high with branches extending 276 feet in either direction from his massive trunk. The measurements of this ancient sylvan god is etched in the monuments and ancient writings of Codex Caria. These colossal branches provide the court a gold-hued dome of bows and foliage edged in light green. Even in the dark of night, a gold light illuminates the court of elder bows. I have always marveled at the face of the sylvan god. His large face protrudes from the graying bark of this gigantic tree, displaying a jovial yet passive, passive visage. To the enchanted and sylvan races, elder bows was the only god they had ever known. The dome formed by the limbs of the great golden limb could not be seen from above Everleaf, though long ago it was the highest point of the forest. I had been told that in the past thousands of years or so, the woods had steadily grown up, older trees and foliage decaying into fresh soil whereupon newer trees grow and die. The cycle has caused the entire woods to be raised to its present height, perfectly even with the top of elder boughs. Though undetected from the air, the court of elder bows was deep, far below ground level on the, of the surrounding forest at the center of T.L. City of the Elvani Wood Elves. The only entrance into the dome was through the awe-inspiring Bark Walk. This was a hall of trees long ago fashioned by some forgotten species of magic that had fused thousands of trees together into long walls, trunk to trunk, as it kept them alive. Each individual tree could be seen, though they were stretched into the trees on either side of them, forming a long wall on each side, known as the Bark Walk. The hall was branched from either side, high up, that were all, these branches were also fused together and woven into a latticework to form the breathtaking ceiling of branches and living leaves. The bark walk was long, and when it opened up into the court of elder bows, the walls continued around the entire dome of perimeter trees, all fused together in a wide circle around the earthen ramp that led to the garden surrounding the archaic tree. The bark walk and entire dome was an immense entity of living wood, and there was no place in the world like it. T.L. City surrounded the wall of trees. Even the wood elves could only enter the court of elder bows through the living bark walk. This was the last colony of the Elvani. Home to 17,000 elves ruled by a queen who was more a figurehead than a matriarch. The Elvani could field 6,000 seasoned and very old soldiers. There were very few youth among the wood elves. Most were adults and children were carefully reared and protected. 
I descended below the treetops and into the city. Immediately, I felt the cool air beneath the green canopy. Having dropped through the green leaf and needle canopy, my drake twists to avoid large branches as squirrels in their hundreds explode into dozens of directions. Tree to tree, they fly and leap in panic as sable, mink, and fairy scamper along the ground. Under me, the entire forest floor is moving. My steed lowers to avoid the high bows storming, storming with squirrels as I notice now that I am flanked on either side by two large were owls. The curved talons of the nighting wards are menacing and my drake watches warily. Below a fawn and two polywogs look up as I pass. I see their gathering leeks. Hosts of fairies crawl out of clusters of spruce burls to look up as we pass over. I know that they will follow. My winged mount heaves and we soar between Elvani tree homes of reed-woven walls and roofs. The wood elves are master basket makers. Their homes, fences, shutters, some clothes, hats, basketry, and even coffins are woven of reed. The reed ships of men are said to have their origin with elven fishermen. I peer over my drake's thick neck and pumping wings. Hundreds, maybe a thousand war ponies and light war horses were, were being tended to by the elves while open shops for furnaces and cauldrons were abuzz with the labor of smiths making and repairing armor, weapons, tools, and horseshoes. The tree fort residences of the Elvani were marvelous innovations of branch weaving and sculpting. I flew by great tree trunks encircled with reed walks, some with hanging terraces of gooseberries and ivy. Pulling the reins, my drake responded, and we banked right, the nighting ward staying with us. Seeing the bark walk entry court ahead, I descended as a shudder convulsed through my mountain drake. I saw the same thing she did. In the court was a gigantic alabaster-colored dragon sitting proudly, replete with full ornamental harness and cargo satchels as Elvani guard spoke with an aged, gray-haired, human knight, an air cavalier in full royal Polterian regalia. He was holding his visored, polished helm in the crook of his arm like an officer, rigidly standing before the two exasperated elves. About forty musk badgers lingered near the barkwalk entrance, many scattered around the dragon. They were the hedge guard, each with spear and axe. Their commander, Yarbold, was near to the elves listening in on the exchange. It is said that these walk guard fairies were as ferocious as the mighty war sloths. Landing my drake in the court with the two were owls landing nearby on the court walls, the elves, musk badgers, human, and white dragon all looked at me. The courtyard was where elves questioned strangers and newcomers were entertained and refreshed before they met with elder bows. My drake was tense and her muscles twitched at being under the scrutiny of the colossal worm across the courtyard. The icy blue eyes of the Polterian regarded me curiously. Hopping off my steed, I stretched my sore legs, and I glanced up at the dragon. It was enormous. The reflection of the venerable white worm in the pool at the center of the court only made the creature look even larger. It watched me back with equal scrutiny. I surveyed beyond the short decorative wall of the yard and could see several strategically placed Elvani enchantresses and armed war sloths, and I wondered if the dragon knew they were there. A Polterian was not someone I had ever seen in Everleaf. Hearing that the elven guards were having difficulty with him, I decided to join their discussion, but as I stepped up to the, to the three... A fourth figure interrupted as I stood next to the old knight. Josiah, oh, Josiah, I knew her voice and turned as she collided into my arms. Weola was a thin, pretty Ilvani woman, her stomach round with her pregnancy, and my own stomach churned as she hugged me strongly. Distraught, I took a step back to regain my balance as the elven woman wept into my chest. 
As I held her, the two elven guards shifted uncomfortably at such a public display of elven emotion and tendered towards a human. Behind Wheela stood another quiet Elvani woman, very beautiful, and we looked at one another as Wheela cried. The Polterian observed us with interest. A knot of acid burned through my bowels. What is it, Wheela? My words were in high sylvan, and it was obvious that this intrigued both the knight and his dragon. Wheela was an unusual elf. She was known in Tiel and Everly for her affinity towards humans, particularly we Carrions, and she had invited scandal when she had offered her love to Trevor Sindare the Third, my ranger colleague. I had last seen him at Conclave when I had sent him to Dretchwold Hills to address the lizard folk for an alliance with Shanadar. But the dread seeping into my veins told me that I may have erred. O oh, Josiah, my love, my love is gone. Trevor lives no more. She trembled and I held her tightly, avoiding eye contact, eye contact with the knight and the elven guards. In matters of love and passion, one cannot deceive an elf. As cousins of the fairies, their love for one another is an actual force that can be felt. Likewise, the elf can sense if the love is returned. Trevor fell in love with Wheela. She returned the love, and that bond could only be severed under two conditions. Either he quit loving her, or he was dead. She sobbed quietly head bowed into my chest. The Elvani guard stood silently and several, several elven women stared almost bashfully at our embrace. My mouth was parched, but I had no thirst. I sent Trevor to his death. I had sent Lucretius to seek out Thalius in wandering elms and he, he too was dead. His brother Abdias still did not know it. Did I kill two of my friends? These men proclaimed me first ranger after the dis disappearance of Cavan Nightshade, and now they too were gone. I looked at the elf. I'm so sorry, Wheela. Now, with Cavan's disappearance, that made three rangers gone. I still had no news of Mickle and Shanadar. Last I saw, Matthias was at Kagar Gruul when the Bulbash Alliance fell to the underworld armies. I looked down at her, taking her face into my hands. The female with her saw me do this, eyes wide. I need to stay a few nights. May I stay in your tree, Wheela? She instantly brightened and smiled, nodding. I will cook your stew. Good, we will talk more later. The slender elf nodded again, and only then did she look around to see the elder human knight beside us and the great white dragon observing from above. Yes, Josiah, she said, kissing my chin. I will be honored. As she turned away, her friend stared at me curiously and then followed her out of the court. An unfamiliar voice broke the awkward silence. Josiah, sir. No, my name is Josiah. The elves cannot pronounce it. Oh, my apologies, Josiah, he said as he raised his bushy white eyebrows in humility while performing a slight straight-backed bow. He shook my hand. I am Cornelius, Polterian Sky Marshal, and this here is Ishak Burnbreath, he said, gesturing toward the observant dragon. I looked them both over. I am Josiah, Aeroloft, first ranger of Border Realm. Again, both he and the dragon barely concealed their surprise. A ranger of Border Realm, eh? I dare say that you men are quite legendary, if even half of what they say is true. I smiled, realizing he was just attempting to be befriend me. He looked like he needed a little guidance here. Tales always grow with the telling, my friend. He nodded and quieted. So what are you doing here? I asked, and one of the Elvani guards perked up a bit, understanding a little of our speech. Cornelius truly looked flustered. 
Oh, oh, that's the funny thing. You see, I don't quite know why his stammering was sharply interrupted by the statuesque white alabaster dragon who lowered his head and spoke articulately with a rich, booming voice that silenced the surrounding woods of T.L. City. We wait the old one who travels even now to elder bows. I have waited over five and a half centuries for the summons, and I shall not be removed until his arrival. The gathering mass of fairies around and in the yard perceived the power and finality, but behind these words, though few understood them. Who is the old one? I asked, gazing up at the huge scaled head. His name is Imaricus. The mention of that name sent shock ripples of whispers throughout the community of anxiety, fear, and conspiracy. Hushed conversations erupted with passion among the fairies, and elves listened in an in alarm. The elderly knight stumbled over himself trying to apologize, and I invited him to join me through the bark walk. I assured the elven guards that the dragon was civil, noble, and no threat to the peace and security of T.L. City. I knew of Imaricus. My people called him the far away, and some believe he is very, very old. Centuries. He lived for a long time among the fisher folk on Ada Lake. Now he lives in a tower at Decker's Port. In fact, my grandfather, Jebrail, who adopted Mickle, knew him Marcus and had told us as boys that the old wizard had not aged a day since he himself was a boy. Imarcus was a loner, and had he had been led to believe that he was highly respected by the woodland races, but now I wasn't so sure. The suspicious glances the elves and fairies gave the dragon did not seem deserved. We entered the fantastic bark walk, side by side. It was 33 feet in height and 47 feet wide. It is the subject of tales and legends. Exactly one feet in length, the great hall of fused trees and branched ceiling was often a place of congregation. Cornelius gazed up at the wood-woven walls and ceiling in amazement. Astonishing. He continued to study them, but broke his scrutiny to look upon a group of six fairies sitting quietly watching us through round, glassy eyes. Two halflings, a polywog, a sprite and a sprite stared at us as they slowly chewed on a plump red and white mushroom. They were burning munch root and I could see their behavior unsettled Cornelius. They call it elder bread or fairy bread or some even elder sprout and some even refer to these mushrooms as presents under the tree a type of food, and for healing, rest, and they, the fairies believe it makes them think deeper. I informed the Sky Knight. At home in Arbor Realm, my people called it Amredi, but we cannot eat it. It is not for humans. The fairies harvest it just before and after sunrise. When fairies burn munch root, their awareness is heightened. They see their memories. It gives them peace of mind, bursts of energy, increased strength, and rapid healing. I'm told by elves that elder, elder bread mushrooms aren't even magical. A strange mushroom, Amradi, only grows beneath pine trees and cedar and birch. These four fairies may be sitting in Everleaf, but at that moment they were very, very far away. Passing them by, our attention was directed to a form lying motionless along the left wall, about halfway down the bark walk. At the far end, we could see the golden light of the dome. The sky marshal remained quiet, but I stole a glance at him and could see that he was awestruck at this unusual environment. We walked up to the large, short-haired moor cat curled up against the wall. Just as we were about to pass by the creature, we found that it was not asleep. He looked up and I recognized him. Hello, Josiah. The cat cut his eyes at the old knight when Cornelius unsuccessfully stifled a gasp. 
Silas, it is good to see you. Been a few years. The cat yawned, listening to me. What? I'm hiding. This is as good a place to hide as any, or to nap. Every time I come to Teal, the Elveni imps want lion back rides. I am not a pony. It is ridiculous, really. Ah, well, soon you'll see some old friends. Looked like all of Enchantress was on their way here. Great, the more cat exhaled, not sounding very enthusiastic. I'll have to tell each individual polywog what I've been doing since last we met. Silas looked up curiously at Sir Cornelius, noting the royal Polterian regalia. The cat's eyes darkened. The last time he had seen a Polterian was at the Battle of Gulrun over five centuries ago. Is it really as bad as they say? Silas asked, sounding more serious now. And I nodded. He is thus far unstoppable, I said, referring to the warlord. This is a punitive campaign, in memory of Gul Rune, so to speak. Silas, hearing this, looked pained. And what of my cousins, he inquired, thinking of the A-year of Sigil's Arch in the citadels of Shanadar. I took a deep breath. I don't know. The battlefront is all ready to splinter dark. The arch fell weeks ago. I lost two rangers on the other side of the front. Maybe three. The feline features showed their alarm. Rangers are dying? Troubling, Josiah. You are such good men. The Sky Marshal and I continued up the bark walk. As we walked, I could feel Cornelius glancing at me. What is it, Cornelius? Er, um, Josiah, what? What's going on? There's something happening and I'm just not seeing it. I feel like I've just walked into another world. I mean, uh, exactly what is this extraordinary place? The old man looked as lost as a child. You're in the last settlement of the Wood Elves, Cornelius. The center of the world of the fairies. You're seeing creatures that most of my own people have not seen. Few humans ever come to Everleaf. Fewer still are admitted into the Bark Walk. Things are chaotic in Border Realm. Terrible armies march upon us from the underworld and they will not stop until they have raised Polteria. We're about to enter a court and you're going to see some really unusual things in here. I, I just heard a cat talk to you, Josiah. I wanted to laugh at the serious expression the old man gave me, but I could see he was a little shaken. Cornelius, I've lived here in the Outlands all of my life. A ranger is in my blood. You're a bowmaster. You're a carrion, he said matter-of-factly, and I nodded. At the end of the bark walk, we walked up to a pillar of golden, shiny hair. Cornelius's eyes were wide, taking in all the sights of the immense dome. When the fountain of hair turned around to face us, the elderly sky knight froze as still as death. The yellow-green skin dryad stood in front of us and touched my face with a smile. She was taller than the both of us, but delicate and very feminine. Pale amber eyes looked into mine. These eyes could easily mesmerize most men. When Cornelius stopped trying to peer around her and looked at her squarely, he immediately fell under her spell. To stop him from rudely gawking at her, I squeezed her wrists and shook my head slightly. She grinned mischievously before releasing the Polterian from her witchery. A girl can't have a little fun, Josiah. Cornelius stared at her pretty mouth, not com comprehending what they were talking about. The leader of the wood nymphs had no problem pronouncing my name. Yes, when she behaves herself, Ashray, I smiled, introducing Cornelius. He nodded and kissed her hand, but couldn't quite manage to get any words out. Her breasts were hardly covered by her thin silkworm blouse. Ashray was one of the fifty jubilants, or the daughters of elder bows, a dryad of stunning beauty. Looking at her flawlessness, 
one would never guess her to be many thousands of years in age. Ashray was one of the four Shars, the eldest of the dryad daughters of the Archaic Tree. These fairy women were playful, intelligent, flirtatious, and very powerful. Drawing their powers from the ground itself, they were also they have also been described as terrible and threatened. She swept her hand out in a wide gesture and looked back down through the court at the many visitors scattered about. Oh, they are already arriving, Josiah, she sang. Why? Who told them about the invasion? Only whispers, Josiah. Rumors brought by birds. The fay are gathering at the call of our father. Elder Bose has called for a council. The three of us looked out over the expanse under the dome of golden greenery. The merged trees of the bark walk opened out and separated into two walls encircling the dome floor from which there sloped downward to the central area. Though I had been here a few times already, I was halted by its magnificence. Coming into the court of elder bows was tantamount to entering sacred ground, like a central axis amid a world all his own. Elder Bose, the golden limb, was the tree of trees, a divinity who lived among those that worshipped him. Around the base of the massive golden wood cedar trunk was a well-tended garden of fairy flowers with little faces protected by a ring of 360 white stones. I tried to imagine what Elder Bose looked like eons ago when he towered over the whole forest of Everleaf. Here we stood, in a holy place now hidden in the woods. Though obscure, with so little known about him, he is found in the legends, the older annals, the prophecies, and in the dreams of men. Elder Bose features prominently in children's tales and fables, but his connection to mankind is a mystery, unknown. His wide, peaceful face with slightly protuberant eyes radiates a sincerity that none can match. His face was a third the way up his massive trunk, but his girth was so immense that he did not appear as tall as he actually was. It was not until one began to descend the slope of the court to the base of the archaic tree did one begin to realize how gigantic he was. His colossal dimensions were only contrasted by the immensity of the dome that his own limbs provided a ceiling for. But when others stood before him, it was quickly noticed that he was the size of a great building, as those described in far Polteria. The rich, dark earth garden around his base appeared so tiny, flowers with their little blinking eyes, rare fairy plants found nowhere else in all of Dagothar. Only the daughters of elder bows were ever allowed inside the barrier of stones to enter the garden. At the edge of the white stone ring reclined a green dragon looking small so close to the archaic tree. It raised its head and stared at us. And with the single movement of the fey dragon, everyone throughout the court quit what they were doing to turn back and look at us. I started walking down the slope with Cornelius by my side, and I realized what a pair we made, a ranger and a Polterian. But I knew they all waited on me. Elvani scouts, archers, some enchantresses, and even a wood elf knight were spread around, mingling with groups of halflings, other dryads, and nymphs, a few yelkai from enchantress already arriving among others. A tiny fairy dragon whisked about, having clear dragonfly wings. Cornelius stepped closer to me as we passed a, a tree giant, sitting on the floor with brown and green skin and hair like poison oak. Several blink and you miss them clover bantams darted in various directions, unable to stand still, large brown eyes looking perpetually astonished. A pythonist sorceress with serpent eyes and elegant scales stared at us. I could not tell if her expression was one of intrigue or malice. A leprechaun I knew personally named Stephus 
was standing with two war sloths, powerful three-toed sloths in armor, renowned for their valor and militancy. I know some of the war sloths who do not eagerly deal with men, but their leader, Manax, was an elusive mystery. Manax was one of the greatest heroes among the Fae. I knew he was not present because he wore a distinctive white lock of hair and had a wicked scar across his chest that set him apart from the other sloths. They all stood about eight foot tall and were as identical to one another as much as Ashray was to her sister Dryads. A few of my own kin were here as well. A famous carrion bard named Evander and a popular gypsy woman named Annabeth. They were here with some carpenters from Arbor Realm. Everyone seemed to move out of our way as we walked down toward the face of Elder Bose. Several furtive glances behind us had Cornelius and I looking backward to see hundreds of fairies streaming out of the bark walk and into the court. Elvani, some Yelkai, another dryad with Silas the Moorcat, more war sloths, halflings, willow weirds, musk badgers, and the hulking white dragon, Ishak. Throngs of fairies of all kinds pressed in encircling us. As I looked up at the domed vault of Elderbow's branches, the origin of the Fae was no mystery. They tell us they were bow rot. Long eons ago, they were simply branch born from cocoons that fell from the limbs of the archaic tree. Now, gazing upward, I cannot doubt it. The Fae inhale my sense. Ageless wisdom recognizes the pollens of Enchendris I picked up on the wind, the smell of the grassy plains of Nosh, the hardwoods of Splinter Dark, dust from the mounds of the Scorpionids, the Hadachi wild elves, and the odor of their cats. They smell on me the cold stone of Devil Spire Peaks, the stench of orcs, of fear and of fire, battles. Old trees of distant dim wood and my mountain drake is a scent that they know well. Before I speak, they already know the direction of my words. A stir among those closest to me, I know they smell the underworld. I stand surrounded by creatures that see, hear, smell, and feel beyond my kin. Sylvan beings that read the flight of birds and comprehend the songs of insects at dusk. As the closer fairies sniff, others further back merely touch them. In sharing, scores, then hundreds of fay know all that the closest to me know. Sharing is a unique fairy trait. In moments, this awareness spreads to hundreds down the bark walk, and then like a plague, it sweeps into the thousands throughout Teal City and the forest beyond. With the slightest touch, the Fae silently share memories, insights, discoveries, thoughts, feelings, and sense. Before I leave this dome, all of Everleaf will know. I felt Cornelius staring at me too. The entire dome fell silent. Anticipation like incense in the golden air. Standing in front of the divine colossus, I looked up into a face that many said was as old as time itself. Under the soul-bearing eyes of Elder Mose. Josiah. His voice echoes through my entire being. My heart pounded at all I was about to relate. My lord, I am now a first ranger. I regret the words that I must speak, the tidings that I bring you. A new warlord brings an uprising and marches on border realm. Gasps, stunned and paralyzed faces, and a stifled moan were heard even before the dryads were finished with their translations. The pained expression of Elder Bose was more in sympathy for those in attendance than for himself. Then the woodland god spoke. Still your heart and gather your thoughts. Breathe our peaceful air, and when you are ready, tell us everything from the beginning. Speak freely, first ranger. 
Even when the truth is evil, it must be told. I cleared my throat, the only sound in the whole dome. As creatures and beings thousands of years old listened in silence, I told them everything. This concludes Episode 1 of the Phalorn Saga. Episode 2, King's Bane, Beneath the Bastion. The Bastion was known by all. The huge central tower of the castle dreaded by the people of King's Bane. Nine of its residents had assembled in the secret vaulted chamber under the bastion, five stories below the surface. Assassins, they referred themselves as the Guild. They eyed one another suspiciously. These nine were members with long proven histories of killings and intrigues. They had been briefed on the identity of the mark. The unusualness of the assignment had taken them aback, and the chamber quietened as a result of this. Until now, most of the members of the Brotherhood of the Dagger had never met. This was a peculiar break from precedence, both exciting and alarming. But Haraginus did not like it, and for reasons that had totally eluded the others. New members of the guild were always allowed to cut their teeth on difficult assignments, and, of course, they were always shadowed by a more experienced assassin in the event that any folly on their part needed mopping up. If it was a slight infraction, then a probationary period ensued, but more than likely, that was the final assignment. Death was the reward of failure. There would be no amateurs running around representing the affairs of the Brotherhood. Never had the Guild summoned two established members to take out the same mark. And never had the mark been a ranger. Haraginus silently listened and observed those around him. In this chamber were the best hired killers in the Outlands. But none matched Haraginus in skill, cunning, treachery, raw power, knowledge, and experience. All of the lifetimes of the others in the chamber added together and multiplied by a thousand could not equal the years that he had been alive. The other assassins glanced at him, seeing an average-looking human in a red robe, unaware that this was a mere projection. An easy, natural ability, like wearing a smile. Haraginus was hellborn, a special species of demon and mortal trappings infamous even throughout the hells and the abyssal plains. Demons known immortally as free walkers. The assassins saw an iron chain mace in a red garment, not perceiving that it was a powerful necrocraft chain mace of dark fire, and the robe was infernal armor. But his true lethal expertise was entirely innate. Natural demonic abilities no assassins could learn. But as all priests and wizards experienced in dealing with demons know, being a spawn of the hills was not always advantageous. His knowledge was vast, but in traversing so many worlds, always only as a visitor, local situations and phenomena always perplexed him until he acclimated to the new environment. And right now, he was very perplexed. On the long table sat a peculiar coffer adorned in unusual glyphs. The High Steward of the Brotherhood of the Dagger bent over and opened the box as all of the assassins watched on. Haraginus could sense the tension in the room, smell the fear, anxiety, the suspicion. He saw the hands near to their handles and pommels, hold out weapons, thigh knives, sleeve dirks. 
He knew that some weapons were enchanted to act on spoken commands, that a few people even had powerful items that would prove very interesting in a fight with each other. There was no one in the chamber he feared. The lid opened. Inside the coffer were 120 square, flat amethyst wedges and 24 uncut crude, crude gemstones, onyx garnets, topaz, and splotched carnelians, all thumb-sized. A ring of twisted metal was withdrawn from the coffer, and Elaric, the steward, displayed it for everyone. It was plain, twisted metal with a symbol etched into a triangular platform. Putting on the ring, he snatched a torch off the wall and held his hand above the flame as he spoke. This one obviously protects the wearer from fire and, and from heat. So far as I have seen, it is forever. Whoever kills the ranger receives the whole coffer. Still, the flame about his hand did not burn him, nor seemed to touch his hand. He returned the ring to the box, and the assassins eyed it greedily with the other treasures. As they were distracted by their desires, Horaginus studied the symbols on the aged fungal wood material of the coffer, knowing that Ilaric had already set aside the guild tax. This be hollow realm currency, Ginge stated, a second generation draconian bloodmancer. The other assassins raised their brows and looked at Alaric. Draconians were from the underworld, and they would easily identify the coinage of the deep. Our benefactor is indeed far away. What difference does this make? Elark looked at Ginge, and the bloodmancer shrugged it off. But Haraginus was intrigued. He had not yet visited the underworld of this particular planet. Almost all worlds had some form of thriving subsurface biosphere, Pretending to lean over and peer into the coffer, the hellborn slightly touched the edge of the box. Instantly, on physical contact with the fungal wood container, the demon saw an image of a tall, slender, dark, green-skinned figure wearing fungal armor with long fingers and large, oval, reflective eyes, tinted in crimson beneath a thick hood of a robe sewn from human skins. The vision told the Free Walker two things immediately. There were humans living in the underworld, a culture of civilized and ferocious people called the Baradai, or the Deep Men. And two, these humans had a very ancient and terrible enemy, a Merle. Haraginus had never encountered a Merle before. The years of their lives were the epics and ages that measured the rise and fall of whole races. Few Merle had ever come into existence, and this was the only world where any Merle had ever developed. Powerful, hateful, ageless, and indigenous to the rock known to other worlds as Aden, the demon found that his curiosity was greatly aroused. Why would a Merle seek the death of this ranger? Horaginus thought for a second, envisioning the Merle at the top of a vast underworld hierarchy of close followers called Minions, who in turn had followers that ruled whole civilizations, tribes, armies, and the races in the deep, an infinite number of agents that could hunt this ranger. Seeing things in this light, the demon now viewed the question from a different vantage point. Who is this ranger that the Merle cannot oppose personally? He stopped touching the coffer and leaned back against the brick wall to think. At the table, sitting seductively, Samantha picked up some of the curious gems and let them drop back into the little chest one by one as the others watched closely. These shall go nicely with my collection. Sam was a bit under five feet tall with black eyes and long braided red hair. Her skin was porcelain white and she looked no older than 11 years in age, but all knew she was much older. 
Samantha had racked in more kills working for the Brotherhood than every other assassin combined. In the short time he had worked for the Guild, Sam had triple the contracts of Haraginus. The other suspected Sam of being a witch, but only Haraginus knew that the seductive little girl was a 93-year-old white succubus. Middle age for her species of half-demon, the white succubi were able to appear in beautiful forms as opposed to their dark kindred. Sam's sexual appetite was unmatched, and she routinely visited the slave markets, purchasing men and women for her private dungeon. It was known that the Marispawn Witch of Edgehaven sent her presence every once in a while of enslaved priests who were caught at sea. These were Samantha's favorite toys. None of her pets or lovers survived her dungeon. Even Rivensail pirates have found themselves on her deathbed. What makes you so sure you got this mark? sneered Smeldus, the only halfling present. His notoriety came from the dangerous weapon he wielded. It was a fairy craft relic called a doom slain. His strength lied much in, the, in his smallness, but his weakness was evident to all. Smeldus was smitten with Samantha. Yeah, Sam, you've never even been outside of Kingsbane, Alaric remarked, eyes keen to watch every gem drop back into the coffer. Haraginus remained silent, mentally excavating through the lie in the steward's words. A demonic trait. When a demon hears a falsehood, he can instantly travel through the speaker's memories to observe the truth that is concealed. The demon relaxed, knowing it was of no immediate consequence that Samantha had in fact been out of Kingsbane twice, both times sent by the Brotherhood to forge and maintain an alliance with the Queen of Edgehaven. Because, Smeldus, dear, I have divined it. Samantha smiled alluringly at the halfling, not unaware of his lust. She decided at that moment to take her open-air bath on the balcony at his next guard duty. Haraginus looked around the chamber at the others. He acquired information about them with mere cursory glances. Aside from Alaric, Ginge, Sam, and Smeldus, there was also Hack. He was a human and ex bounty hunter turned assassin. His prized possession was a two-handed longsword named Kinflare. His infernal senses picked up that it radiated magic. Standing next to Hack was a slender, lithe, shadowy feminine form, Naya Luna. She was even rare among the fairies of the archaic race of the Phalorn. Her feral appearance, midnight oval eyes, and silence unnerved the others, and Samantha openly disliked her. She did not know that Naya Luna was ancient, much older even than the Athrodoc fairies that she knew in Harrowwood. The demon knew she was a dark silk nymph. She almost never spoke, but when she did, it was in monosyllabic whispers, never repeated. She stood as one with the shadows, wearing a see-through gossamer veil over her voluptuous purple-black smooth skin. Upon entering the room, Haraginus had studied her first, perceiving that she was also a shadow caster and wickedly cunning. Her method of killing almost offended the Hellborn, for he was, by his own account, a civil demon. He grinned inwardly, knowing she wanted to eat Hack. Apart from Hack, the only other human member of the guild was one of the Red Men, a former Silnadorian mercenary assassin who had transferred from another guild. His specialty was in traps, snares, and long knife fighting. His name was Talok. The others, including the steward Alaric, thought that there was yet another human member in the room. This was Shatis. But the Free Walker was not fooled by the enchanted disguise. He, too, was Athrodoc, but not of the Phalorn, and his morphic sorcery allowed him to appear as an ordinary human. 
His true form was that of an old pan. A satire with shaggy goat legs and ram's horns on his head. His hooves, disguised as boots, were phantom shod. Not even by the dead or demons could his footfalls be heard on any surface. Though Shatus legally lethally wielded a poisoned knife, his preferred weapon of assassination was a beautifully crafted oak flute. When placing his finger fingers over all five holes, it became a pipe that shot a dart, delivering weavern bask venom from splinter dart. He could enchant crowds of people with his music and kill his mark with a dart without breaking a note in his spell-wrought songs. Lastly, there was the ever-quiet, brooding Chroniacus. This elder gnome, a priest-sorcerer, believed himself to be the instrument of the gods. His destiny was grand, deserved, and awaiting him. Fame and glory were soon to be his. He understood the ways of the world. His colleagues were petty and only a small part of the grand design. In honor of his own chosen stature among the gods, he sacrificed his marks in elaborate rituals with a sacrificial knife called unholy severance in a script etched down the length of the blade. Horaginus mused, for there was something almost romantic in turning an assassination into a religious performance. How the hells are full of the allies of gods. Horaginus mused, looking about the room. By a spell cast a few days earlier, the mark had been located. All of the assassins had been issued a pair of glyphlock visors. These devices were a magical, a dark cover over the eyes that made it impossible to see, but did produce a glowing red dot in the direction where the mark was located. The perfect assassin's tracking device. All of them put on the visors and turned their heads in unison to face due west. Horaginus went through the motion, but he did not need the visor. He could see any, anything any one of them saw by peering through their mind. Only Nyaluna would per perceive his presence, so he let her be. Hack thudded his gauntleted fist on the hardwood, catching everyone's attention. Too many on the mark, he lark. He spat while looking about the table at the others. Will you invoke immunity? The question hung on the air in thick suspicion. Immunity was rarely invoked and had not been enacted in at least two decades. It was from a prior time when guilds were independent houses having no centralized authority. Guild members were not permitted to kill indiscriminately in their pursuit of the mark, though in their private lives there were no such prohibitions. Assassination as a trade was an art of infiltration, execution, and stealthy escape. Immunity granted assassins the discretion to kill others who get in their way, and in this case, each other. Smeldus glared pure hatred at Hack as Samantha grinned thinly, licking her dainty lips. Talok the Silnadorian remained stoic, and the gnome priest Chroniacus pulled up his sleeves, shifting from foot to foot. Yes, immunity is granted. We consider this mark a top priority. You mean to say, Ilark, Sam breathed seductively, you've already taken the guild tax from the coffer and have no plans to return the bounty. The others thought this an astute observation and nodded as Ilark left the chamber. But Horaginus perceived something else entirely. As soon as Ilark had let the words escape his mouth, the Hellborn realized that the matter of immunity had already been discussed and decided between Hack and the steward. The demon felt a very real fear from the steward about failing this assignment. Again, Horaginus mulled over the interference of this rule. Despite the tension, there was a nervous excitement in the air and smelled to stiffen when he felt the small toes of Samantha press and dig softly against his stomach under the table. 
She smiled beautifully and tilted her head at the halfling, wide-eyed, and she grinned, suddenly aware that, that he had an ally, that she had an ally in this race for the mark. The succubus knew all she had to do was lay with him and she'd own him. As the group dispersed to begin preparations for their overland journey west, Horaginus brooded, finding himself standing alone in the room. A very powerful and old entity from this planet's underworld contracted the Brotherhood of the Dagger to take down a single ranger, a mission so important that every assassin in the guild and one from another was assigned to it with immunity invoked. But this free walker knew something important that the others did not. This ranger was not like any mark they had ever hunted, and it was this fact that disturbed the Hellborn the most. There was definitely some more investigation to do. Since joining the Brotherhood, he had put down many marks. In his spare time enjoying the sights and luxuries of Kingsbane and environs, he had even defeated and run off a couple minor demons. Horaginus could not recall all of the wars, battles, skirmishes, and single combats, combats excuse me, he had participated in throughout the plains. But he was rather proud that he had fought to banishment a few devils in the hills who were jealous about his free walker status. He had even participated in the ambush of an angelic solar and lived to tell about it. He knew that in the spheres of the sacred and profane, there were some conflicts that a demon had best not interfere with. He was going to find out if this was one of them. Resolve hardening within him, Horaginus then sensed a change sweeping through the city of Kingsbane. Something was happening. A breath later, the first alarm bells began to ring. This concludes Episode 2 of the Phalorn Saga. Kingsbane, Coast of Hinterrealm Also known as the Scourge of Hinterrealm, the city of Kingsbane was a stronghold of thieves, bandits, smugglers, pirates, hired blades, mercenaries, assassins, outcasts, exiles, and slavers. It is the most densely populated human area in all of Dagathar, outside the kingdoms of Polteria and Silnador. These criminals lived in lands ungoverned by royal law and networked their dark trades and services to one another or paying customers from Lower Polteria, from Hinter Realm, and the mountain folk of Drake Roost, the smugglers retreat of Rogue's Eyrie, and the frontiers of the Red Men of Silnador. Kingsbane is a city of great antiquity, having numerous occupation levels spanning thousands of years into the past. Polterian archives assert that if the odd underground city of Candlewick in eastern Polteria is not the oldest occupied residence, then Kingsbane is the oldest continually inhabited city in all of Dagathar. The city wall was constructed of massive blocks and itself was surrounded by extensive suburbs, mostly shanty towns. But the harbor front was heavily fortified with great manors and tower mansions behind them. Kingsbane would never be taken from the sea. Polterian jurisdiction had never extended this far southwest in the Outlands. In fact, Polterians did not seek to pass through the great forest of, Har of Harrowwood. Those trees were old and inhabited, and for as long as men could remember, they were occupied by treacherous, dangerous fairies that did not suffer groups of men to pass. Strange creatures, the fae, for from time to time they taunt and torment lone men or women, exiles, seeking to escape Polteria, people who survive Harrowwood, but swear they will never go back again. Without any official law and order, this criminal culture thrived into a powerful government of bandit lords, dreadful Rivensail pirates, and Edgehaven slaver, 
envoys, with local fortresses and garrisons supported by various territorial gangs from which they recruited. The police, the military, the city guard, border patrols, the wharf watchmen, the spies, tax collectors, jailers, the whole power structure of Kingsbane and environs comprised of the group called the Iron Fists, the largest, most powerful bandit organization in all of Hinterrealm. The Iron Fists did not fear Polterians, they hated them. Those unfortunate Polterians captured by the men of the Rogues Eyrie and sent to Kingsbane or exiles who escaped Harrowwood to suffer capture by the Iron Fists. If lucky, these were enslaved. But most were tortured at public gatherings. There were many exiled Polterians living in Kingsbane, some thriving, having fled prosecution or banished by the unfair judiciary that openly served the wants of the aristocracy and the merchant guilds. Kingsbane's location was kept, pretty much kept it safe from, from the Polterians. The mountains of Drake Roost were very high and snow-capped, and Harrowwood ascended clear up to the timber line, while its eastern edge thickened into the Datham peaks of Lower Polteria. The closest real threat was the large military garrison and training camps of the Polterian Military Command at Three Bridges Garrison north of Datham Peaks but this was a few hundred miles away. Throughout the streets and courts of the city, business was going on as usual, gray-cloaked iron fists walking about, watching everything. Slavers from Edgehaven far in the west had unloaded two dungeon ships full of human cargo. The miserable lot of men and women, captured farmers and tradesmen, merchants, sailors, fisher folk from Hinter Realm, Arbor Realm, and the wild folk of Deepor, they were corralled into holding pens underneath the brick streets. The slavers herded their victims through the narrow corridors of the shadowy old city, a vast network of tunnels and chambers below the streets and courts of Kingsbane. The deeper architectural skeleton of a city built atop long ago and over an even deeper, more ancient level. Furnaces were stoked and branding irons were kept red hot day and night as buyers crowded the slave market. Wretched people were stripped naked, even young boys and girls, cords tethered around their necks as they were paraded up and down platform walks. Those purchased were immediately forced into copper-banded wooden stocks by large iron fists. They squealed in agony, unable to move as slavers burned their new master's sign or symbol into their skin of the foreheads. Slaves resold had their foreheads literally melted smooth with hot irons, and new brands were burned into their right hands. Day and night, the high-pitched screams of commerce filled the air as the booming slave trade conducted its business. And for every slave bought, the iron fists received a tax. In the market square, almost a thousand people were crowded around the 60 or so booths and long tables that advertised stolen and smuggled wares from Polteria, Silnador, and Arbor Realm, carrying goods like beautiful embroidered garments, scarves, and tunics made by the women of Arbor Realm, the loot from an Arbor Realm merchant vessel. The crew were at the market being sold to various buyers. Goods from Silnador were smuggled by those in business alliances with the Red Men, the kingdom of avowed enemies who hated the Polterians just as much as the people of Kingsbane did. Bandits from Rogue's Eyrie who frequently brought news from Lower Polteria wandered the market looking for new weapons and a young girl to buy. All at once, thousands of heads throughout the city looked up as a single bell began to ring. The slave market stilled. All grew quiet. A second bell joined and followed by a third, all ringing frantically. Pigeons in tight feathery masses lifted off of the buildings, agitated. The massive fortifications lining the wharf in the bay area of the city supported 21 towers, all having bell watches. A system of warning. The ringing ruckus began to fill the city. 
Iron Fist moved better in, into better positions to see what was going on as gamblers paused, traders covered their wares, merchants checked on their animals and wagons, henchmen huddled closer together, nearer their employers. Bricklayers and carpenters, sewer rats, street sweeps and cobblers, they ceased their activities to listen. The hammering of the smithies silenced. Harlots began to close the distance between them and their safe houses. The people of Kingsbane watched, hearing the whistling sounding from the wharf, and they moved out of the way as iron fists brandishing weapons throughout the entire city began moving toward the docks. Over 40 vessels were anchored in the bay, and another 50 or so were docked along the wharf. A shipyard about a mile from the central docking platform had three warships in dry dock. In the highest area of the city, the central castle called the Bastion, high in the Donjon Tower, the mayor and his guardians and assistants hurriedly set about toward the docks. As they moved through the streets of Kingsbane, more and more iron fists from alleys, buildings, and other streets joined them. Over 10,000 pairs of eyes stared out astonished to see a single ship entering the harbor. The gleaming white vessel with white sails was a Polterian longship. Hanging from its mizzen crossbeam, in the wind was a blazing gold and red Polterian Royal Military Command emblem. Even from the coast, the people could see those on deck were all arrayed in white with red baldrics except for a black-robed figure and a slender female garbed in red. The people stared dumbfounded at the first Polterian ship to have ever been seen in the Spawn Sea in living memory. Never had the Silnadorians given safe passage to any Polterian vessels. To have sailed around Silnador from the Polterian coasts would have required a voyage of at least six months fair weather, into seas Polterians had never sailed. It would have taken a month to leave Polterian waters and the other five to navigate around the continent that was Silnadorian occupied. According to the Pirates of Rivensail, Silnador had their own isles full of pirate coves. Enemies of Polteria on their northern border, they were never strong enough for a full-scale invasion, but Silnador was very capable of preventing any unauthorized naval expeditions along their coast. The people watched as a Silnadorian warship with red sails and black and gold bulwarks lined with shields turned to intercept the white, gleaming intruder. The galley of red men quickly moved into position, a double bank of oars making it look like a many-armed sea monster. Its nose was a wedge with the iron-tipped ram. They saw a white war drake with a rider lift off the deck of the Polterian ship and go hover over the Silnadorian ship as red men cleared a space on deck for the beast. Even in war, there were protocols. Eight Silnadorian archers ready to release poisoned arrows covered the Polterian, who wore silvery shining armor under his white military overcoat. He remained astride the beast and leaned over, handing a Silnadorian a cyl cylindrical packet. All continued to observe as the Silnadorians took turns looking at the unraveled parchment, returned it to the knight, who then took off on the wardrake to land again on the deck of the Polterian longship. To the disbelief and consternation of the people of Kingsbane, they saw that the Silnadorians were not going to give them battle. Their entrance to the harbor went uncontested. What perplexed them even more was that there was no exchange of anything. The Silnadorians were not paid off. The Polterian vessel haughtily moved past a Rivensail pirate corsair called Bloodsail. As it was anchored, there were only a few pirates on deck, but they glared at the Polterians, noting the ship's name, Seeker of the Ancient Lost. On their starboard side, the Polterians looked out at a gigantic flagship named Chained Maiden, one of the main slaver vessels from distant Edgehaven. 
The Polterians gave the slavers they could see hard looks of contempt, and the slavers looked into the eyes of men and women who appeared very capable of backing up their disdain. The dungeon ship was almost empty. Most of its crew were in the city, unloading their hapless cargo. The ancient lost moved forward through a group of fishing trawlers, bringing in their morning catch. The harbor was full of trawlers, whalers, fisher craft, a couple of barges, several warships, galleys, and longships, two dungeon ships, two riven sail pirate corsairs, several skiffs, and many more reed sailing ships that are quite unique to river folk everywhere. Along the wharf, freighters were being offloaded as merchants on the spot purchased their cargo and bid wars turned into fist fights. Numerous buildings along the wharf were inns and taverns, brothels, bathhouses, money changers, ale houses, and latrines. Here is where a hundred whores a day haggled with seamen for their fare. But these activities ceased and every building emptied as people streamed out onto the quay to line the wharf and watch the Polterians. Already over a thousand people along the wharf, from the shipyards to the harbor city gates, stood staring in disbelief. Iron fists wearing gray cloaks over leather armor and bearing spears, swords, and axes flooded onto the quay. Some riven sail pirates, edge haven slavers, and local toughs accompanying them. They watched quietly as the Polterians lowered sails, tying down the halyards, securing cordage, and checking their lashings. All along the ship's gunwale, white-clothed Polterian marines in battle dress stoically watched them back. A local towboat went out, received some payment, and the leads, and the leads, and brought them back to the dock so the Polterians' ship's ropes could be pulled in by the iron fists. The ancient lost had two long cutters, both of them outriggers, but the Polterians did not use them here. A docking bridge was dropped over the side and, ha and harbor men pulled the end onto the dock with a hooked pole. The first Polterian on the dock was a tall, imposing figure wearing a black robe with a hood. His beard was brown with peppered gray and neatly square cut. On his chest was a royal Polterian badge of the Ministry of the Outlands, and hanging from his belt was one of the only five spell, spell blades in, in existence. The other four were back in Polteria among the others of his order at Castle Demerskald. This man was Yurik Arcanacraft, the leader of this secret expedition, a 52-year-old blade magus known mostly as the Arcanologist. Yurik stood rigidly surveying the people all around them on the quay. They stayed a good ways from the docking of the ancient lost. His crew of elite Polterian military personnel had no idea what they were doing here or what they were trying to accomplish on this voyage. Thus far, they had blindly followed Sir Arcanacraft, marveling that he had seen them safely through Silnadorian waters. Second off of the ship was also second in command. Felix Old Pepper, nicknamed the Lucky, had bright red hair and deep blue eyes and always smiled, even when he was killing people. He was the helmsman of the ancient lost and the only true naval captain on board. He was chosen for this mission because he was formerly the captain of the famous warship Asardron. Ten of the marines on board had priorly served under him on the Asardron. Felix wore on his belt a four-shot gnomon-crafted hand crossbow. Stepping off of the quay, he simply nodded to Yurik. Third in command was Cassius Highmanner, a Sky Knight, an air cavalier soldier his whole career. The powerfully built warrior kept two Polterian white war drakes aboard the Ancient Lost. He was one of Yurik's closest confidants. Cassius calmly stood on the archaeologist's left flank as the others behind him crossed over to the dock. Though these were the three senior officers, they were not the sole principals on the ship. Jastin Appletrot had been a captain of the palace guard in Polteria, called the Eyes of the King, known personally to His Majesty Jabus, himself, for he was a distant relative. 
to the queen. Jaston was before that a royal cavalier, and he possessed a relic longsword called Ixacor that belongs to the Ministry of the Interior, a famous dragon-slaying sword. He stepped forth off of the vessel. Hanelin Bellwether was also among the principals, an arch-royal bowmistress, one of the only three in all of Polteria. She wielded a magical bow of stretched steel fashioned anciently and accidentally by a miscast spell due to a mispronunciation by a scribe. Hanelin had already completed her military service in the Royal Guard and had been approached by Yurik after she had begun an archery instructor, uh, instructing campaign under the military command. Since sailing from Polterian waters, she had already taught all the marines on board how the mastery of the short bow. Outside of the group's leader, Master Arcanacraft, Hanelin was third in the expedition's command structure. Should anything happen to Felix or Cassius, she would automatically be third. Hanelin was a normal-looking woman, but she had a body that all other women wished they possessed. Fifth off of the ancient lost, Hanelin looked back at the gawking crowd dauntlessly. The only other female aboard the ship stepped off right behind her. Garbed fashionably in a red robe, sash, and tassels, Militia was a priestess of the Order of the Broken Moon. Though Polterian to her core, she was not military, as all others on the ancient lost were. She was an enchantress, and her addition to the expedition was by special request of Arcanacraft. And only he knew why she, why she was with them. Unlike Hanelin, the priestess was unusually beautiful, and when men fir first saw her, they always gave pause. She was the sixth off of the ship. Seventh off of the vessel was the burly Maximin, a 61-year-old veteran still in excellent condition. Absently tapping the pipe in his breast pocket, he wondered if they were going to find any pipe tobacco here. He had a thick beard, of, of, a bit longer than Yurik's, but neatly trimmed and walked about like a man who carried himself very well. Unlike Cassius and Jastin, he wore no armor, but hanging from his waist was a well-oiled short sword. The eighth figure to disembark was tall, hooded, wearing a white robe, a royal observer. He bore no weapons that anyone knew of. His addition to the group was unwanted and unexpected. The voyage was planned by Yurik and approved by Castle Demarskold's Arcanacrafts and Nightshades and by his, his Majesty King Jabus himself. And there had been no royal observer in those plans. His assignment to the ancient lost had been by the Minister of the Outlands. Who the man was, his rank, capabilities, and even purpose was a mystery, and Yurik had never allowed himself the license to like this man. The other principals treated him cordially, some with suspicion. Thus far, the quiet man had offered little but his eyes. Unlike the others, the royal observer knew that Yurik was not merely a learned archaeologist and blade magus but one of the only scholars in the world of pre polterian antiquities. One of a handful of men in the whole world who was able to translate the old Kedorian writings. What else the observer knew, he kept very close to himself. The eight principals were supported by a well-trained outfit of Polterian marines, ten of whom came from serving on the famous war warship Asardron. Fifty-one marines made fifty-nine people aboard the vessel and two war drakes. Originally sixty marines, they had lost Darren Westham to the fever off of the coast of Silnador. Twelve of these experienced marines stepped off of the ship, joining the principals. Yurik, standing still with Felix at his side, remained quiet as a mismatched group of criminals approached them from the harbor gates that led into the city. The advancing crowd was led by a limping little human dwarf, scowling at them. The hateful beady eyes noticed that most of the Polterians had hands resting on the pommels of their weapons. 
Before the delegation of Kingsbane reached them, Yurik turned around and addressed his people. We will not resupply here. There is another town, non-aggressive, further up the coast. You, you have all been briefed on Kingsbane. Anyone separated from the group will be considered lost. We are going to Rivensail Keep. By the time we return here, our contacts should be in this area waiting for us. They all knew what they all knew what they were delivering. The four marines in the middle held staves from which hung a small coffer. What do we do about hostiles? Jastin asked. Yurik glanced down at the carved handle of the man's famously ancient sword. May Ixacor guide you, the blade magus said solemnly. All understood that to fight here was only to delay a certain death. This was not a fight they could win. A few smiled, though, knowing that Jastin's sword was packed with surprises. Be watchful. If you hear me say anything untrue, do not try to correct me. Yurik then looked down at Militia and at the ship. I wish you would stay aboard. I will not, the priestess replied, a hint of defiance in her voice. Hearing her, Hanelin glanced their way. The bow mistress was not envious of Militia, but she was very aware that her lover Cassius thought the priestess to be beautiful. She was relieved that during the entire trip the priestess had not once shown the slightest interest in the sky night. Yurt turned toward the observer but said nothing. He just knew the man would say something intolerable. The dwarf-like man and his henchmen stopped about 15 feet in front of Yurik. The archaeologist noticed that the little man's right arm from his short elbow to the end of his hand was in iron, ending in a closed fist. Several gray-clad men bearing weapons behind and beside the dwarf were strained, vicious-looking, big battle mastiffs that snarled and gnashed their teeth at the Polterians. The Polterian marines noted that King's Bane's defense was rather well organized. The growing mass of men outside the throng of iron fists carried all sorts of weapons. One goon even held a large oval shield with brass banding. Light ring mail was the heaviest protection worn by anybody in the city. Toward the center, in the back of the crowd, stood an enormous brute, covered in curly hair, holding a massive spear twice as tall as any man standing on the quay. The little man, slightly leaning from some lifelong disease, peered up at the Polterians, cursing. Profanities only half recognized by the Polterians. You ain't no authority here, a pox on Polteria. The dwarf waved a long knife in the air that served him as a sword. Yurik regarded the small man calmly, unmoving. And who might you be? At the inquiry, the dwarf looked as if struck. He was the one supposed to be asking questions here. I'm Ivan, I'm Lord of the Scourge, Mayor of Kingsbane. I am the Iron Fist. He paused, eyeing them, thinking they would recognize him by now. He cut his eyes to the tall, hooded one standing to the far left. Something about that one reeked of wizard. Ivan saw he had no, no weapons that could be discerned. He gathered himself and puffed up. And who the hell pits are you? He asked, eyes bulging with fury. Greetings, your lordship, Yurik began slightly parting his hands and almost imperceptibly leaning forward, simulating a bow. He ignored the half-startled look on the mayor's face and continued, I am Yurik, vice-admiral of His Majesty's Royal Polterian Advance Guard fleet, just here to dock a short while for a prearranged meeting with the local representatives of the Rivensail merchants. I should be on my way within three hours. As Yurik spoke, the observer stared hard at the dwarf, and twice the small man found himself cutting his eyes at the hooded figure. Wizards made him nervous. Ivan's eyes narrowed, and he took a closer look at the other principals, his scrutiny quickly ignoring the observer. All wore white Polterian garments, shiny, shiny, carried shiny weapons, and service sabers, and seemed protective of the gorgeous woman who is adorned in red. Under their robes, they all wore polished steel armor. Did you say advance guard? I did, your lordship. My fleet is now two days back. 
Yurik kept his reply short. He returned Ivan's gaze. The observer, too, stared, but the dwarf did not look his way. There was a softening in the dwarf's features, a lowering of the knife. Will you be resupplying here? No, your lordship. The fifth battle fleet has its own supply frigates. At this, the little mayor's brow furrowed. He appraised Yurik more closely, seeing the badge of the Ministry of the Outlands that he wore. He glanced at the observer who was studying him as well and looked away. He shifted his weight in silence. Suddenly, he pulled his right hand out of the iron hollow fist and arm sheath and wiped the sweat from his brow before shoving his hand back into the metal fist. His mind raced at the implications of a Polterian war fleet so close. King's Bane respects no Polterian. You got nothing but enemies here. Just can't guarantee you safe passage through the city. Ivan stood a little taller, though a leaning a bit, seeing the Polterian pull out a scroll case from his robe with a royal seal. Yurik stepped forward and leaned down, handing the scroll to the mayor. Nor can I, your lordship, offer you the safety you deny me. The dwarf snatched the scroll rudely, broke the seal, and studied the contents of the parchment. The Polterians waited, and the observer cracked a smile and stopped inside his hood. The dwarf scowled, his eyes passing from top to bottom of the script. He then coughed and appeared to read back over some of the contents again. Further back, an iron fist pushed forward and shoved his way to stand beside the mayor. Oh, Gaddick, good you're here, exhaled the dwarf. You might want to read this. He shoved the parchment up into Gaddick's hand and looked back at Yurik. What be the name of your flagship? Inwardly, Yurik laughed, for the dwarf could not read. The blade magus watched Gaddick's face as he read the parchment silently. He saw the bandit's eyes widen in alarm, for it was an imperial edict, allowing the vice admiral of the fifth battle fleet to engage in unrestricted warfare against King's Bane, Rivensail, Decker's Port, Edgehaven, or any enemy attempting to thwart their passage, including further instructions to garrison any resisting region with a battle mage and sufficient soldiers from the auxiliary troop freighters. Gaddick saw the seal looked authentic, and if the contents were true, if a battle fleet was nearby, they had no power to resist the passage of the Polterians. Yurik answered the mayor's question. The Asardron. The mayor flinched. You lie. That ship was dry dock. Old Keel had seen too many battles. We get Devordred traders from here from time to time, bringing us foods and news. We know that's not true. The Asardron is our new, refurbished, and redesigned flagship. A Polterian legacy. His majesty could not let it go. Ivan stared hard at Yurik, pulling on his scraggly chin hairs. Gaddick finished with the parchment, leaned down and whispered in the dwarf's ear. Listening to the iron fist, Ivan cut his eyes from Yurik to the observer and then back at Yurik. Gaddick stopped and handed him the scroll. What's this talk about troop freighters? The little man asked, stepping forth to hand Yurik the scroll. He looked up and saw the Polterian leader's face darken. The Polterian raised to his full height. Your lordship, I will not presume to know his majesty's objectives other than we are heading further west. My fleet is merely an escort to the troop freighter, freighters of the 4th Expeditionary Force and Air Cavalry. You are not. The mayor reeled back and raised his iron fist over his, his, his face. Okay, for God's death, me and mine will escort you to Riven Sail Keep, but then you gots to go. He sounded more confident than he felt, wanting to get away from the unsettling gaze of the observer. Yurik and the other seven principals, followed by four marines bearing the coffer and eight more marines bearing arms, were escorted off the quay and through the thick iron bar reinforced oak doors of the city, the harbor gates. Battle mastiffs barked and growled threateningly, clearing the way as the Polterians were encircled and led toward Rivensail Keep, which was basically a local pirate embassy. The strongholds of the pirates of Rivensail were offshore on islands that were protected by, co by co protected coves armored with treacherous reefs and secret accesses. While they had little physical power in King's Bane, they did rule the Spawn Sea, and if ever the Iron Fist chose to saber rattle, then the dungeon ships of Edgehaven would always side with the pirates of Rivensail. P. 
people of all backgrounds, trades, free and slave, looked at the curious entourage from the streets, alleys, and second-story catwalks. It was apparent to Jastin that the city was built over a much older one. The ground level of some of the buildings was actually the second, third, and even fourth levels of structures that originally stood on the surface far below. Several areas they walked over were rusty iron gratings, and through the dirty squares the Polterians could see moving forms in the shadows. The streets were built over expansive tunnel works and galleries of rock. Yurik's eyes took in all these details, and his imagination constructed a close approximate in his mind, a mental picture of what the subsurface levels of the city looked like. Cities were constructed atop older cities, and no doubt Kingsbane had occupation levels three and more levels deep. More people could be underneath the city than on the surface. He turned slightly, seeing the priestess move up alongside him in the press. A lot could be said of a man who lies so convincingly, she hummed. I would fear to be taken into your confidence, Sir Arkana Craft ever weighing the real from the imagined. Her curly auburn locks of hair framed her beautiful face as she arched an eyebrow at him. I will stake my life on a, on a lie if necessary. He was about to say more, but Jastin on the other side pointed something out. As they traversed through a warehouse district, it was easily seen that water was not free here. They passed a large wrought iron bird-like cage and open prison over a bricked well. Two slaves, malnourished and dirty, locked in the cage, worked at levers pumping the water out of a spout and into a bucket for those who stood in line and paid the stewards. Grass bedding and stools showed that this was a lifetime appointment. One of the haunted-eyed slaves watched them pass. They were escorted past the harbor master offices in a garrison with three-story towers, only half filled with armed men that glare, glared balefully at them as they moved through the press. There are men in the crowd who have kept pace with us since leaving the wharf. Dark cloaks like uniforms. They are not iron fists. Jastin whispered to Yurik, who only nodded. The blade magus had come to appreciate the former royal palace guard. The eyes of the king were trained to be very diligent in noticing threats. Seeing Yurik nonchalantly remove the clasp over his long sword, Jastin did the same, followed by Cassius and the Marines. When, the, when they were walked into the first town square, they were met with hundreds of onlook, onlookers with stupefied expressions who moved out of the way. Under their feet were several iron-barred roofs over sidewalks below the court. Underneath them stumbled lines of people, men and women, chained neck to neck. As they shuffled through the dimly lit halls, some were crying, and a few cast their eyes upward, but they could not see the Polterians because of the brightness. I hate these people, Hanelin hissed. She had already removed the caps on her belt quivers. Two of the three fastenings on her slender dirk attached to her right wrist were already undone. The court was lined with several brick structures with assorted painted signs. These signs read, Bits and Pieces General Store, Omar's Apothecary, Shiny Things Exchange, Wayfarer's Inn, Skinny Winch Tavern and Eats, which advertised a brawler's pit and feats gambling. One store was called the Manacle and sold nothing but slaver gear and accessories. Yurik and the other's attention was drawn toward the center of the court at a raised platform set angled like a leaning wall that had two brown-stained iron beds on it side by side. Each bed had wrist, waist, and leg clamps and chain reinforcements. Hanelin cringed. The archaeologist looked back at her but spoke loud enough for the other principals to hear. Kingsbane holds a weekly fair. If any of us do not make it out of this city, those left behind will be chained to those beds. Do not get separated from the group. What do they do? asked Militia. Gambling. They gather around the victims and they place bets on all sorts of unsavory things. The people tell the torturers what they want to see and then they bet on which men or women will scream the loudest or the longest who passes out first, who begs for mercy first, who can live the longest as fingers, then hands, feet, ears, noses are sawn off. 
Stumps are burned to stave off the bleeding. Rum is fed to them to keep them alive longer. Sometimes people draw lots for the privileges of torturing the survivors to death. Many Polterian exiles and other unlucky bastards have entertained these sick people. There's a lot of folks in this city hoping that we're the entertainment tonight. There'll be a lot of killing before that happens, the arch-royal bowmistress said through clenched teeth. She caught Malisha's beautiful eyes appraising her. Down a wide street full of laborers, beggars, crooks, and iron fists, Ivan the mayor led them waddling to the front of a three-story compact citadel constructed of various kinds of stones and bricks of different sizes and makes. It was obvious, obviously built using the rubble of much older structures. A flag stretched between two poles in the air. It was solid black with a huge tear through it, but it was cr crudely sewn back together. Yurik realized the rip was intentionally, unevenly stitched so as to be seen as a tear from a great distance. Riven sail, Yurik mused. I suppose even pirates can be creative. They made it to Rivensail Keep, but their attention was diverted to a slave auction taking place across the street. They all stared at a balding man draped in hair, hauled, hauling off a wheelbarrow with a nearby naked and bloodied man in it. He had opted to be killed rather than serve another as a slave. Unfortunately for him, the flesh merchants of Kingsbane had long experience with this kind of fortitude. They would not kill him yet. They had, they had beaten him unconscious in front of the others and sent him into the dungeons below the city. He could end up as a chained bed slave to one of the wealthy vixens in the city, or as a victim on the torture beds, fed to one of the monsters kept, kept in the undercity, or broken by the slavers of Edgehaven, or maybe even turned into a respectable bandit soldier and joined the Iron Fists. The Polterians watched as a woman, completely naked, was shoved to bend forward, putting her neck in a wooden platform, head pushed down and neck locked in a stock. Her arms were held by two large fat men, and a third man casually planted a red-hot branding iron into the skin of her forehead. Unable to move her head, the woman wailed, her whole body tensing rigidly, and she sprayed urine behind her. Hanelin jerked, raised her bow, and the others saw already she had arrow knocked. Hell no, she grimaced as suddenly powerful arms slowly forced her to lower her half-raised weapon. Tears of rage blurred her vision. Maximin embraced her from behind, a solid mass, a veteran she admired. He whispered to her, If you live through the war that you're about to start, where we cannot win, your fate will be worse than hers. He released his grip and she relaxed, hardly able to tear her eyes off of the trembling woman. When another scream filled their ears, Cassius leaned into Hanelin. The bowmistress noticed through rage-red eyes that the henchmen, the iron fists, and even the mayor seemed not to be aware of the screeches and squeals. Just business as usual. The large doors of Rivensale Keep opened and admitted Yurik and the principals, save Maximin, who wanted to stay outside with the Marines. Ivan fumed when he saw that the accursed pirates did not even look surprised to see Polterians in his city. He stared at the observer's back as the hooded figure disappeared inside with four Marines bearing the locked coffer. Ivan spat. I hate Polterians. Maximin and the Marines were oblivious of the resentful and hateful looks they received from those on the street. As realization that Polterians were nearby spread to the slave plaza, pitiful pleas for help lifted into the air, but were stifled by the cracks of whips. After only a few moments, Yurik and the others emerged from the keep without the lockbox coffer. Ivan struggled to get a better glimpse of the slender, iron-hinged box the lead Polterian now had tucked under his arm. Ivan was infuriated that he was not privy to this particular exchange, right here in his own damn city. Quietly, he led the way back to the quay, growling at the battle mastiffs to get out of his way. And they did. On the march back toward, down toward the ship, Jastin again moved alongside Yurik. 
Sir, I saw the one you described. The man is still alive. Good. By now he should be waiting on the docks. Once they had reached the wharf safely, the Blade Magus turned to Ivan. Your Lordship, many thanks for your hospitality. May we never meet again. We no longer require your escort as our ship can be plainly seen. Thank you. Ivan stepped up to say something in a puff, but quite forgot his words when he saw that the hooded observer was watching him intently. The hairs on his neck raised. He stammered, coughed, couldn't find the words, and turned around and walked, walked over to his men. As the men on the docks positioned the boarding bridge into place, the Polterians milled about, few taking notice of, of Yurik standing beside a thin man in a plain brown cloth shirt and pants, worn with age. The gaunt figure pretended to be coiling a rope beside a large hoist cable. His hands were weathered. Have you something for me? Yurik asked, pretending to be interested in the cable. Only Jastin, Militia, and Maximin were within earshot. Ay, I do. Are my papers with you? Yes. The archaeologist produced a small scroll case and gave it to the old man, who handed Yurik a folded leather skin. The stranger pulled the contents out as he hunkered, hunkered over the rope. Trembling, his eyes misted over. In his grasp were Polterian citizenship documents. A His Majesty's Royal Pardon Certificate overturning a banishment order and a 10,000 royal gold note. There are silver coins in the case, enough to get you to Three Bridges or Dorath City. Godspeed. Sniffling, the man steeled himself but still looked down. Decker's Port are a good people. We'll take in Polterians, even, even exiles. Just follow the coast to a thick wood. The Arbor Realm, Carrion Folk. Shoulder the coast and you'll sail right into Deathalon. What's left of her? The map shows everything. And thank you. At his last words, he choked. The ropes coiled, he lifted them up and disappeared into the gangs of people along the quay. Must be some map, Maximin stated. I mean, a king's pardon? Yurk looked at him. Those documents are a death sentence here. Before they can have value, he must get to Kingsbane, get out of Kingsbane, traverse Hinter Realm without being caught, either pass over the frigid mountains or walk through Harrowwood. Unlikely. The Rivensail pirates control these waters. After today, we will see no more Silnadorian ships. We are on our own. We paid for safe passage, but there is no guarantee they'll honor it once they learn that there is no fleet. We've bought some time and secured a valuable map. They all knew what the mayor and the people of Kingsbane did not. That the Polterians had forged a tenuous alliance with Silnador for the first time in history. Both governments were desperate for the crew of the ancient lost to succeed with their mission. But of all aboard, only Yurik Arcanacraft knew exactly what that mission was. Once the Polterians were on their ship and leaving the harbor, Ivan screamed a series of orders to his people. Iron Fists and their deputies disappeared in different directions, executing his commands. Get two sentinels aloft and go east in search for a friggin' fleet. I wanted them looking yesterday. Gaddick! Give me a constant eye on Rivensail Keep. I got your reward for anyone who can tell me what was in that damn coffer. No pirates move. No, there ain't no pirate shitting in my town without me knowing it. As more Iron Fists listened now to Gaddick, they all went off on their errands. Ivan stood silently brooding. He realized that he'd learn what was in that box. A pirate can always be bought. Just such a pirate stood amidships on the deck of the Rivensail warship, Bloodsail. He watched through an onocular as the seeker of the ancient lost left the harbor and turned west along the coast. He withdrew a flask of swirled glass from his pocket, unstopped it, whispered a few words into the brownish liquid, and then dropped the open glass container into the sea. This concludes Episode 3 of the Phalorn Saga. Episode 4 
of the Phalorn Saga. Dax Clovenheart knew there was nothing normal about the beast. The creature had six muscular legs, sharp claws, small eyes like that of a hog, and an overly wide mouth filled with jagged teeth similar to that of a shark. The animal felt no pain, no fear, and therefore it maintained no self sense of self-preservation. A dangerous animal, the size of an adult bull, it stank of festering mulch. He stood beneath an old moss-covered hawthorn tree and looked a bit out of place among the enormous cedars that blocked out the sunlight. At his feet the beast stilled, exhaling its last breath. Perplexed, Dax leaned on his knees, trying to catch his own breath. At six feet, five inches in height, and 350 pounds of solid bone and rippled muscle, the blue-skinned rhinotaur stared at the unholy beast. The upper half of Dax's single nose horn was capped in shiny metal. Dax Clovenhart was a ranger, and he was not thrilled about almost dying to a mere animal albeit a very menacing one. Though he was a highly decorated and experienced ranger, no Rhinotar had ever been to Dagathar. His own home was very far away. He cleaned the blood off of his thigh saber. The six-legged monster had lost a leg, had its left eye popped out its guts hanging from it in two different places where he had eviscerated it, and when it had tried to bite down on his left arm and had its own tongue ripped out hanging loosely from its razored lower jaw. And still the creature lunged at, lunged at him. The smell of burnt flesh acrid assaulted his nostrils. Three smooth burn holes pitted the animal's horrid face. Dax grabbed his pack and took one last look at the foul creature before again moving along the lake's edge. What in the hell was that thing? Already it had been an eventful morning. For hours he had slowly moved at the water's edge in the shadows watching an area further along the shoreline where thousands of orcs and other things cleared out a space of forest, opening up the woods to the water line. The trees were stripped and neatly tied together to form a protective wall along the wide road. Earlier, he had followed their progress after learning that this road cut through Dimwood for hundreds of miles west to east toward Devilspire Mountains. It was then that he had caught a glimpse of the enormous spidery creature with the large ogre on its back. Around him were four armed, four armed dark elves and some dusk giants. He had anticipated on seeing these things, for he had been briefed in detail on what to expect. But no one had told him about the six-legged monsters, and for this, he was pissed. Dax was unaware that after he had wandered a couple hundred feet further down the coast of this immense lake, two wooden knots under a mossy humps in the bark of a hawthorn tree slowly opened and deep brown eyes striped with green surveyed the surrounding forest. Satisfied that no one was near, its lower branches reached down and fingers unfurled from the twigs. At the base of the trunk, a, the tree split and the tree opened exposing slimy greenish tentacle, tentacle roots having a serrated teeth. Scores of these appendages sprang out and dragged the carcass of the umber slog into the hawthorn's maw. The poisonous dendrite expanded its girth as the slog was lacerated and stuffed inside it. Moments later, there was no trace of the beast. The tree would not feed, would not need to feed or hunt again for at least a year. A couple of hours ago, when he first arrived at the lake, Dax had surprised two hornback orcs on Basilax that had been running through the woods at an astonishing speed. Both orcs glanced at him as they passed with expressions of surprise. They had never seen a rhinotaur. A few moments later, the orc and riders returned with a much larger creature, a slower one also with a rider. 
it had eyes almost on the side of its head, which was mostly a scarred brow bone. The orcs flanked him on the run, on the running reptile things, and he cut one in half with his thigh saber, the velocity of the beast doing the work for him. The other hit him dead, dead right in the chest with a spiked mace. When the heavy mace struck the rhinotaur's torso, the ring was sharp, and looking backward, the orc's jaw hung open in amazement when his blue-skinned enemy merely took a few steps back after the blow. When Dax looked back ahead of him, it was too late. The hammer tore, caught him by surprise with its rapid strike body impact. The knotted brow bone hit him square in the chest, and this time he flew backwards to crash onto his back. Pack of weapons and gear tossed aside. Unable to breathe, and with the big animal bearing down on him with thick square teeth, the rhinotaur extracted the wrist ring garret wire and strangled the beast. The wire slicing bloodily into the muscles and sinews, the animal whimpered in panic and at the same time that a spear embedded in the dirt besides Dax's face. The spear lifted as the orc attempted a second stab. The garret wire was designed to cut through most metals and the hammer tore was unable to free itself. The more it pulled, the deeper it cut. It wailed pitifully and before the orc could throw the spear again, Dax let go of the one side of the wire and the beast pitched backward bucking the orc. Terrified of the blue-skinned figure, the animal roared in pain and panic before disappearing into the underbrush. Without a steed, the orc quickly stood, straightened the spear, and charged, screaming as its lower jaw tusks drooled and gray-sprinkled skin contorted in rage. Still having trouble drawing breath from the impact, Dax reached out, grabbed the spear, backfisted the smaller orc to the ground, crunched its neck under a heavy boot, and turned around to meet the charge of the orc and rider with the mace that had tried to ride him down a moment before. The mace still in mid-swing, the orc glanced down in shock at the spear lodged in its stomach. The rhinotaur watched him ride off into the woods to die. With no more adversaries, he had caught a knee and fought to breathe. After he was okay, he grinned and knocked on his chest. The armor rang. It was slightly blue and clear, of a material not native to anywhere around there, an armor no one in Dagathar had ever seen. This was earlier. Now Dax stood on another tree at the, edge of the, at the edge of the lake. Over two miles down the lake's edge, the clearing was finished and the orcs seemed to wait around. Surveying the lake, which was like a small sea, he wondered if they were waiting on ships. As he too waited, the sun ascended high into the sky and he rested after applying salves to his cuts and lacerations. He smiled at the acquisition of new scars. His mind wandering, drifting back to images of home, to his son, who was now training to follow in his footsteps, to his estranged wife and their impossible relationship, his old buddies and former missions, he was instantly jarred back to the present by a muffled explosion. It was felt through the ground more than it was heard on the wind. His first instinct had him searching the sky, already reaching into his pack, years of training honing his reflexes. But it was silence. A second later, a light wave ring flattened the surface of the lake, spreading out from a central point about 1,500 feet away from the clearing that had been, he had been watching the orcs uh, make. A mound of water rose up about 20 feet high and spilled upward like a fountain of blue-green shattered with bubbles as if ca cavernfuls of air were released from below the lake. He watched in awe as the lake level lowered. It flattened back down into a myriad of ripples again. They're not waiting, waiting on ships, he thought. The shore closest to the churning water overextended the bounds of the lake as the lake suddenly raised. Dax glanced further up the shore and saw that the rise in water level was gentle, an expansive mound of water slowly approaching his place of concealment. Trees seemingly sank along the edge, and the lilies and grasses were swallowed, vanishing beneath the new water line. A geyser of water shot upward from the maelstrom, and a black stone construction emerged. Dark polygonal stones, perfectly fit together, arose out, 
into a siege fortress of cyclopean construction, four stories high, 65 feet wide, and 69 feet front to back. It moved atop the water, toward the shore, thousands of feet away, and hovered up the new lake shore, clearing the water. Dak stared. The hover fort was made of stone, but it floated about six feet off of the ground, dripping water from the channel runoffs. As it disappeared down the cleared forest road cut down by the orcs, the stone citadel was followed by a second one that also emerged out of the lake. Then a third broke the surface of the lake, followed by a fourth. Four floating castles emerged from, the un from underwater and moved out of sight. Then two more ascended out of the lake at the same time, floated up the bank and vanished into the woods. Six battle keeps. The Rhinotaur muttered about sorceries and such and kept watching, noticing that the lake stilled, but a lot of bubbles were breaking the surface in a concentrated area where the floating forts had first appeared. Dax noticed grasses reappear and trees look as if they were growing taller as the lake's water level was going back down. The bubbles and underwater chaos seemed to stop, only to reappear closer to the embankment where the road was cut down through the forest by the orcs. The Rhinotar studied the water, seeing the second underwater storm dissipate to be replaced by a third, even closer to the lake's edge. A fourth disturbance of bubbles grew into a watery smooth mound that got taller until the water was running off the surface to splash back onto the lake. A small hill of glass got bigger as it broke free of the surface and rose high into the air as the ranger took several steps back and stumbled backward to land on his rear between two trees. The colossal head of some gigantic prehistoric beast emerged out of the lake, a 22-foot-long head as a second, much larger mound of water smoothed over and its body began rising out of the dark water. Its cranium was ridged heavily with dorsal horns. Dax saw that the creature wore a massive harness, a fortification, dripping tons of water, well over a hundred feet with no tail, it climbed ashore upon four enormously thick legs. Wide, badly scarred, hooved feet sank ten feet in the mud. Its neck was thick and very short, low hanging so the beast's wide head could reach the ground. The longer teeth pointed upward and veils of, of green lake algae hung from the underworld creature. Numb with disbelief and wanting to put some distance between himself and anything else that might come up out of the accursed lake, Dax turned around and began moving west through the thick trees. He had not traveled more than a thousand feet or so when the wood quietened around him. He slowed, then looked up in time to see a dim shadow darken the foliage above his position in the woods as something big flew over the treetops. He began running. After moving about 90 feet and breaking hard to the left for another 60 feet, he looked back to see the shadow darken the area he had just been in, passed through moments before. Now he distinctly heard the sound of wings flapping. Instinct possessed him more than training as he instantly burst into a run and dove into a root burrow as the base of the lean, at the base of a leaning cedar as furry animals with round eyes and floppy ears receded deeper into their tunnels. A rush of... A rushing gust of vaporous mist blasted a hole through the foliage and branches, and he looked as wood warped and liquefied into a brown steaming puddle. A coppery smell assaulted his nostrils. Acid. The hole melted through the tree ceiling of the forest, but the creature that hovered over the treetops could not enter. The dark form continued only for a moment and then flew off. What in the hell was that? The Rhinotar stood and dusted off. He glanced back toward the lake and then turned toward the deeper woods heading west. He had some old ruins to go look through. It was Dax's first day in Dagathar and already he had suffered through three potentially deadly encounters. This concludes Episode 4 of the Phalorn Saga. 
Episode 5 of the Faelorn Saga, Dimwood Forest. I never made it to Talandathar, the legendary ruins of this seemingly dateless city would need wait another day, or never. Cavan had told me much about the mysterious city of half-buried buildings of an elder age, so I was in no hurry to investigate them. I jerked the reins of my beast and she responded, her ribs between my thighs expanding as she drew breath. Branches whipped coarsely across my face and I cursed Cavan. He is the reason I now fly, 80 feet above the shadowy dirt of Dimwood, moving eastward through gnarled branches of three and four thousand year old cedars. I blast through an insect swarm, spitting the things out of my mouth while gripping the saddle horn as my panicking mountain drake weaves through the trees. Branches and foliage pass by my face four times faster than a galloping steed. Noticing the sparse light creeping through the thick canopy of greenery above, it is easy to understand why this old forest has always been called Dimwood. My winged mount whirls around a gigantic vine-strangled tree and looks back to blink a fearful eye at me just as we dip and my stomach feels afloat. Dipping suddenly under a twisting branch, her wings reach upward and pull back with a tremendous heave. We soar underneath the ancient canopy as colorful birds explode in several directions trying to flee. I look down behind us. Clawing up the dark soil in pursuit were two lightning-quick reptilian things with riders on their backs. They seemed to be grinning up at us, but... I they did not worry my mountain eye. I glanced behind me for something I knew was there but could not see. The gigantic trees did not willingly give up their secrets to strangers. Somewhere behind us and darting like a demon through the woods was a slender, black-skinned goblinoid thing with leathery wings and a long spear. My drake was terrified of the winged goblin and was nearly breathless in her flight. Very soon, I would have to land her. As twigs jabbed my face and scratched across my hands and arms, I could hear the leathery-skinned orcs yelling in their hideous monosyllabic speech. The wings of my drake were not pulling as high anymore. She was tiring. Spotting a massive bow ahead, I steered her down to a mere 30 feet off of the ground. Circling the gigantic tree, we landed on a stretch a great reach above the orc riders. I now faced the direction from which we had fled, drawing an arrow from the saddle quiver in my turn. The bulk of my drake shuddered instinctively and tensed, flattening against the ancient bark of the enormous tree that we now stood upon. I knew she sensed the approach of the flying goblin, from out of the shadowed greenery, the inky dark form of the winged pursuer emerged with a vile scream. As it advanced with a snarl, I loosed the arrow and ducked into the, fo and ducked into the folded wing of my steed as the goblin balled up, wings enwrapping it before plunging straight down into the brush below. It quietly thudded into the packed earth. I shouldered my bow and studied the thing from the safety of the tree. I had never seen a winged goblin, nor any goblinoid creature of the species. It writhed in agony about sixty feet from the base of our tree. Its wings were tipped in red but were otherwise black. It had slender long fingers wrapped around the shaft of my poison wood arrow. Yellow eyes glared balefully up at me. The orcs too had seen this and had turned their extraordinarily fast lizard steeds. Our brief landing in the tree had caught them off guard. They had continued on. I pulled out three more splinter shaft arrows. The poison wood would ensure they would not return to tell any tales. These dangerous arrows were carved from the bodies of vicious dendrite tree beasts that were sometimes caught by the elves of Everleaf. Though, I, though rare, I risked them. 
I must live to report what I have seen. As they neared, as they neared, an arrow tore through the face of a snarling orc who was just, who had just looked upward at me. A second arrow followed quickly, sinking deep into the upper left shoulder of his companion. He screamed just as a third arrow impaled his left hand and penetrated into the back of the large lizard's neck. The reptilian mount squawked and lunged blindly through the dark underbrush almost faster than I could blink. The other lizard followed without a rider. The dead orc was motionless near the foot of the tree. In a few moments, the other steed and rider would die from the poison, no matter how far they got. Descending to the forest floor, I inspected the dead orc, my arrow sticking out its face. It had a large mottled horn protruding from the center of its back that pointed upward, attached to its crooked spine. The point of the horn was almost level with the top of its head. A hornback orc. Though I had never laid eyes on one, it was known to me from stories that it was not a surface-dwelling breed. Their fast mounts were unfamiliar to me. They, too, must be from the underworld. Turning, I looked back at the dying goblinoid soldier lying prone in the fallen pine sheddings, wrapped in its thin, sickly-looking wings. It glared back at me. Dull embers were in its eyes. A noise drew my attention and I looked to see the other reptilian mount I had not killed. It was calm, eyeing me warily and looking at the dead orc. Only a beast, I thought. Knowing my own dumb animal was hungry, I slew the vile thing with two fire-hardened birch arrows and let her feed. And she fed, tearing flesh and smacking wetly as I surveyed the massive, massive trees keeping an eye on the fatally injured goblin. A strong sensation of being watched touched me, but I did not feel threatened. I know this wood was full of life. Somewhere hidden from my sight, I was being observed. Probably fairies. A dozen thoughts assailed my mind, chased by a score of questions. What in the devils is going on? Cavan Nightshade was the first ranger. His assignment had been way out here in the west of Border Realm, in the unruly, uncharted regions of Dimwood, far western Dagathar. Cavan is a veteran of noble Polterian blood, the only true Polterian I know. Others from Polteria who live in Arbor Realm are exiles. <clears throat> I, for me, I am Carrion my people inhabiting the great forest of Arbor Realm. We are a collection of small woodland communities, but we are the direct descendants of the once mighty Kadorians native to ba ba Border Realm. Though I have never been to the vast empire of Polteria in the far east across the Drake Roost Mountains, Cavan has filled my head with stories and descriptions of its cities and people. But that is Cavan's life not mine. It is to be admitted that, of all the rangers of Border Realm, Cavan is indeed the most prestigious, the most knowledgeable and experienced. Some say he was supposed to be a scholar. He is widely venerated for his contributions and feats, but he is best known for his sword. The Nightshade clan of Castle Demarskold in Polteria are lower nobility, but they possess a family heirloom, an artifact of potent power in the form of a shimmering longsword called Mage Slayer. The history of that blade is rife with stories of fallen wizards and darkly enchanted beings that walk the world no more. The Nightshade men are proven swordsmen. Cavan Nightshade does not simply disappear. My drake tore flesh from the dead lizard with abandon as my mind played back the images I had seen not an hour ago. Flying over the shadows of dimwood above the spiraling butterflies, I had flown across a straight line in the forest of downed trees that were being stripped of branches and stacked like walls along either side of the cleared out road. There was no doubt, doubt about 15,000 orcs south of Lake Mirdolhenen. 
they were cutting a massive road through the forest. But there were more than orcs. I saw peculiar goblins and tiny halfling-sized engineers wearing large, flattened metal helmets. There were ogres of immense size with horns sticking upward from their brows. These ogres were not known to me, all having one single large horn and much bigger than the ogres of our haunts. I stared blankly at the moss on the old bark as my mind drifted back to the hideous, four-armed black elven things and the most horrific creatures I had ever seen. They were the size of bulls, had scaly dull hide, and would look like patches of scraggly reddish hair and six muscular legs ending with long talons. I could see no necks, but their wide mouths were full of teeth. These abominations were without riders, having no harnesses, but they seemed to yield to the will of the four-armed dark elves. This was no question, an invasion force, or a part of one, not from these lands, but from the underworld. I had flown over them and was instantly pursued. Before fleeing, my eyes had fallen upon the most disturbing sight of all. A ghastly vision lingering at the edge of my mind like something I was supposed to remember. A dream that was actually the reality of another time, some other place. Sitting on the back of a gigantic armored spidery monster was a huge single horned ogre wearing the hide of some underworld beast. It supervised the labor and black elves having too many arms seemed to report to him and carry out orders. He looked up at me, and I saw the face of death. Their work was progressing as their wide road cut the forest in half. This was no ordinary ogre. Today was no ordinary day. That cavern was missing made it all the more unusual. A soft gasp caught my attention, and I turned to see that the winged goblin had expired. My drake, my drake mare noticed it too and stopped chewing, blinked, and then continued chewing lazily. Out of habit, I quickly surveyed the dimly lit forest floor, then scanned the upper branches high above. This was a very old forest. There were no human settlements for hundreds of miles. Most believed Dimwood to be a myth. My name is Josiah Aeroloft, and I am a Border Realm Ranger. As a carrion, I have the pale green eyes characteristic of my people. Though I am not a citizen of Polteria and have little love for its people, I report important tidings by pigeon to the King's Minister of the Outlands, a faceless man I have never met and never will. Border Realm is a wild place, untamed by men, forgotten frontiers inhabited by many races and species. Lands and beings most Polterians refuse to believe exist. We Carrions are few in number compared to so great an empire. Woodsmen, carvers, carpenters, loggers, rivermen, trackers and guides, gypsies and explorers, and our women are known far and wide for their embroidery. Carrion garments, drapery, and tapestries are treasured in all markets, merchant guilds, and even palaces. We Carrions honor no kings. Our rulers are bards, prophets, and rangers. Descendants of Bowmaster Kadorians, we are a proud people, and I am the last descendant of the House of Aeroloft. Like a nymph whose soul is entwined with her lake, we too are protectors of these lands our predecessors roamed. For this we few carrion rangers are respected by the sylvan and dwarven races who ordinarily regard men with disdain and suspicion. I had flown for a few weeks to get here after leaving the last conclave. To me it was assigned to find our missing first ranger, but now Cavan Nightshade would have to wait. Nor could I return home just yet. An ogre on a giant spider brings an army from the underworld toward my homeland, and there's something distant yet familiar to me about this development, an elusive memory that laughs at my inability to catch it. I let my drake rest, taking the time to adjust the straps on my double-quiver baldric. 
My bow was a gift from the Ilvani wood elves of Everleaf. Finely sculpted, one of my quivers holds the poisonous splinter shaft arrows, and the other was full of flint, iron-tipped, and some magical halo-burst arrows also given to me by the Ilvani. Though I'd never used one, I had seen the destruction they inflict. Another quiver hangs from my drake's harness, holding many obsidian-headed arrows with a couple more poison woods. Also attached was my war axe, forged by the dwarves of Emim Guard. My favorite weapon is a blue steel long knife with our border realm ranger insignia on the inside of the shiny blade, an arrow encircled by seven stones on a shield. Insects I could not see began chirping nearby, and the distinct hooting of an owl broke the silence from the darkness in the branches above. My drake blinked up at me, but did not stop chewing. I listened to the force begin to awaken again, satisfied that we were alone. Many evil stories are told about this place. The few elves and fairies of Everleaf that talk to me have warned me away from this wood. They whisper of creatures in shadowy Faelorn that have never been seen in Border Realm, some stories almost unbelievable. Almost. Unlike humans, exaggeration and lying are not fairy traits. Once finished with her meal, I mounted my mountain drake and she raised up and stretched along the expansive bow of the gigantic tree. Powerful muscles rippled front to back of her flanks. I looked around one last time. The trees were heroic in size, and I knew there were many things living high amid their branches. I exhaled anxiously, knowing that I might have to return to this forsaken place. Fifteen thousand orcs cutting down a road that pointed eastward toward my people's lands and neighbors. What needs so large a road through this wood? Don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm the one telling you what happened because I am one, one of the few who survived. I'm just the voice telling someone else's tale. This concludes episode five.